Um, I know most of you are here okay. because of so you're like interested in elastic, but I hope you'll be interested in Kubernetes as well. Well, you need to deploy it first in order to use it. So I'm here to talk about Kubernetes right. and application management here. Uh, well, sir, the Kubernetes. Quite a few. Uh, how about Docker or content container? Okay, so I'll introduce first uh, containers. So, container since not a lot of people know about containers, so it's 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 kind of a uh, way to build your applications uh, with their dependencies uh, in an isolated environment. So it's more portable. Uh, it's more consistent. So once you build your um, Docker image, or so we're mostly um, using Docker for our containers, but there are other technologies. Um, I haven't prepared a lot of slides. Yet. So it just packages your application. <coughs> now. What are the benefits of it again is that so your your applications are consistent wherever you run them because you're running the containers. So the problem with containers is that once you scale it up, it gets hard to manage. So we have Kubernetes, which is a um, container orchestrator. So say you have uh, several machines. Um, the list is like three node uh, cluster. And you have to make your application highly available, or you have to scale it up. So, what Kubernetes does is that it manages that for you, it finds which um, nodes are available, um, and it also has services covered. So, if you have different services or different applications within your um, your whole application, so you have a microservices or service-oriented architecture you can easily connect each one, even if they are deployed in different machines. So Kubernetes does that for you. It's, it's a um, container orchestrator. It was first developed by Google. Um, so this is just the history. Um, it's quite boring. Um, so let's talk about application management. Um, there are different <coughs> Kubernetes workloads in the, uh, there are different workloads in Kubernetes. So the most um, smallest one, which is the building block of Kubernetes, are called pods. So this is more like uh, if you're familiar with Docker, when you define a pod um, for Kubernetes, it's more like defining a, a Docker Compose file. Yep. So I have here an example. So So I'm running this, uh, I actually have created a Kubernetes cluster in DigitalOcean. So it's, So as um, Sam mentioned earlier, they already have an offering of Kubernetes. So I have here a command command line tool which is called kubectl, which connects to the Kubernetes cluster in DigitalOcean. So I have created the one node cluster <laughs> just for the for this demo. So the way you see that um, the nodes is that you run this command, this is kubectl get nodes. So I'm running one node with the version 1, 1.5. So it's 
do you want to run Tomcat in your uh, cluster? So you have here a, a pod spec. This is the spec, which says here that you need a container that is um, named is Tomcat, which is going to run an image, which is, is Tomcat image from Docker, with the tag eight Alpine. Um, you can look it up on Docker Hub. Uh, there are several technologies that are already available in Docker Hub. So if you want to run this, you can just uh, create a file similar to this. Kind of spot, API version is version one. And there are several metadata, which I will talk to you about later. But you have to put here a name and a link and labels. So if you want to deploy that, you'll you'll just run uh, this command. Dash f means uh, point to this file. So we are using the YAML markup language but for for this, but um, Kubernetes also accepts um, JSON. But this is more human readable. So it says there that it's already created. Now to list the available pods, you have to run this command, kubectl um, get pods. So now it's running. Uh, we have the test pod running already. That is in DigitalOcean's managed Kubernetes. So sir, you were asking earlier what's the difference between the DigitalOcean's Kubernetes and your VMs. Um, I'm not affiliated with them, but mostly if you say manage Kubernetes, um, they will be managing it for you. You don't need to have um, to set it up yourself. You don't need to create Terraform. Uh, what's what's the for the Terraform? Yeah. Provisioning. Provisioning, yeah. So you don't have to create those configurations to build your own clusters. You just Actually, have you can do that. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I have the API settings, but I, a, I build a Terraform for solution with the droplets. Right yeah, now they, with have the the, they have the Kubernetes service itself. So all you all, also it's also support the API. So all you need is like mm. you need to uh, execute the API with the nodes, number of nodes mm. and where is the workspace I guess. So it actually is for the yeah. Okay. Yeah. But so you don't have to create your own master node, only the worker node. That's what you're saying. You, you just have to specify with their. There is no master node. So everything is. Yeah, everything is in DigitalOcean. So they're the master node is in DigitalOcean. Yeah. You only so have to create that worker node. It's almost and like uh, no ops. Itself, so yes. you don't you don't need to have infra guys to create it for DigitalOcean. Do that. So let's try here. Um, I'll just go to show you. There's nothing in localhost API. So now we're running this. Um, you can actually expose this in your local machine by running a port forward. So um, kubectl port forward and the name of the pod and then the port that you want to expose. So for our case, it's 880. <coughs> Now, if I refresh this, we should have something. So we already have a Tomcat uh, running on the, the digital oceans Kubernetes. So it can be any other Kubernetes for those that are not familiar. Um, you don't have to say you're deploying your um, applications. You don't have to create um, deployment instructions for your DevOps guys or your CloudOps guys or your Infra guys. Saying you need this type of machine, you need this. No, <coughs> you just have to create your pod manifest or the deployment manifest, which uh, which I'm going to show you later, and then you run those commands. Maybe put it in your pipeline or Jenkins pipeline, and then it will do it all for you. So. Um, one question. Um, does digital ocean provide? That is the monitoring tools for providing CPU and memory management. That I'm not sure. 
I have to ask what, what the Bishop of Osha. They have a free But anyway, um, Kubernetes has some. Um, <coughs> yeah. 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 There, there is one tool which is helpful. Oh, you have to create the policies to do that. Mm -hmm. But is it container level profiling? Uh, you can you're using do, the data do the same with containers. You can. There are available Helm charts if if you're familiar with Helm. Yeah. There's a Helm tool. Yes, but I'm trying to, to use the default ones. Uh -huh. Easy to pass. Instead of paying the company, I think that's okay. But for the, the easy to it's not that so um, easier profiling. Yeah. The management and CPU allocation for each part. I think Easy to CloudWatch doesn't have the memory monitor. So finding they have yeah. um, they, they have, they have uh, uh, already integrated with the their controllers. They can profile the the they container, each container to for manage uh, for uh, not no they 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 have the memory that need the inside the Kubernetes you know, to have the access to Kubernetes to only to the API and some get the data. Uh, yeah, in the pool has the ocean, right? Yeah, no, no, no. Manage details. <coughs> have profile yeah, inside, but outside they don't have anything. Right? So now that you do that, they just have a body. Um, have you tried really seen really any other container aside from Docker? There's, uh, there's Augur, there's, there's Rocket, uh, there's Kubernetes. Like in EWS, we have uh, uh, or Docker. Yeah, We're yeah, actually yeah. trying to move forward to Austin and MCI. We're trying to talk. Move towards that. Um, yes. Yeah. So OCI compliant. Um, yeah. Uh, but Kubernetes does support if other container engines uh, like Rocket. Uh, so, but here we just use Docker because most of our images are already built in Docker. So we we don't need to migrate them. Uh, yeah. Or rebuild them using another container engine. So, yeah, but we're moving towards. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think there's no one issue with that. the Docker. They take the same application. So, what so happens is you can have actually a noisy neighbor. Let's say one so container can actually consume all the It doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen. One container can actually consume your CPU and you have the storage of the other container. Yeah, that happened to us, but. It's mostly uh, <coughs> on, on the underlying yeah, so they have technology the, uh, that applications use. They have the inbuilt application. Like for us, so what you need we're to using an older version of Java. Yeah. Like one, I think one way to do it. So uh, what happens is that it doesn't know that it's already yeah. running in a container. Yeah. So it thinks it's still running on the host like machine. <coughs> so it's eating up all the resources. Yeah. It's called the noisy name. Uh, solutions like you know, say, you know, uh, device and AWS uh, para proper. They actually have, they call it so mini, the, the uh, they call it micro VM. Uh, so they can isolate one. So if you want, there's a few of them in it will not interfere to any adjacent uh, containers. But actually, you know, in Kubernetes, you uh, can you can specify the resource allocation. So so this is preventing what you call noise service. So, like for example, there are actually yeah. quality of services that you can define. Yeah. So yeah. you can have, um, you can you can usually have noisy neighbors if you are using the best effort um, quality of service. So that will usually pick up all the resources of the host machine. But if you specify um, a guarantee or a burstable um, quality of service, then you would prevent that. Um, okay, so the next workload is replica sets. Um, this one, this one is, our, is actually a controller now because we have the building block is the pod, and we have several controller types, which one of it is called replica sets. For, for this one, it just tells 
Kubernetes to deploy a certain amount of replicas for this pod. So an example of that is here. So you actually have here the kind of replica set and you specify the versions. Um, and then the replica set spec. So here you can see there is already a field named replicas and you define that it for this application I need three replicas of this pod. And this is the pod spec actually. So what I have here you can also see here is the replica set. Um, this is an example. I, I won't be running this one. Um, there's the next one is the higher level of uh, controller of replica sets, which is a de which is the deployment. This is more declarative, and you can actually update your configuration more. There are more features than the replica sets, so this is more recommended when you are deploying your application. Okay. So, yeah. okay. I have here uh, an example of a deployment, which is going to deploy an nginx um, server or navigation. So, again, this is from the Docker Hub. So you can actually have your own private registry if you have one. No, you can see here I can deploy just one replica for now. Um, this is the pod spec again. So I need an, this image to be run on our Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going to first delete the the pod that, that we created earlier. So we have the manifest file. You can just uh, reference to that and then it will delete the pod. While that's deleting, I'm going to create the deployment. So I, I'm already showing you how um, application management on Kubernetes using manifest file. Um, this is more recommended than than just running it on the command line because with an app or with a manifest file, you can store it in your um, Git or whatever uh, versioning system that you are using. So again, I'm going to get the pods again. Uh, I'm just going to list the available pods. So we have an nginx deployment here. Um, but what if you want to increase this or scale it? You want to have um, three available pods for this one. What you can do is just um, edit the file, and then you can run kubectl apply and deploy the file. Just so you can see here, um, nginx is uh, the nginx deployment is configured. Now, if you're going to list the number of pods again, you now have three running pods for nginx. I'm going to show you later how, how Kubernetes will load balance that. So the next one are the sets. Now, um, sir, what's your name? Mark. So Mark was um, asking earlier if there are um, profilers or monitoring tools with DigitalOcean. Um, actually, in Kubernetes, um, you can use different uh, tools like Prometheus with Grafana to do that for you. Um, so since uh, <coughs> if you want to monitor all the applications and also the host machines, 
you want those agents, the Prometheus agent, to be present in each of the hosts. So what we can use is the um, Kubernetes controller, which is called the daemon sets. Now what the daemon set will do is run it on each available node. So say you're also um, fetching your logs, on the, or your Docker logs, and putting it into, or extracting it, and pushing it into your central logging system, like Elasticsearch, uh, with Kibana. So what you can do is to have your, for example, you're using FluentD or FluentBit. You can run those FluentBit and FluentD as daemon sets so that your FluentD agents will be present on each of the nodes on your clusters. So you don't have to manually um, run the agent as a binary on your machines. You can run it as, as a Docker machine or a, actually a pod in a Kubernetes cluster. And then all you have to do is just mount those volumes, those host, uh, host volumes that they need to listen to, to be able to fetch your logs. So this is very... Yeah, one thing to add there, we don't uh, support Grady. Like, uh, we kind of like, Elastic doesn't support Grady because like, we were not developing that. Yeah. So you could use a uh, B or file B yeah. and deploy the same as a uh, demon set. Demon set, yeah. Yeah, we have the file bits as well for Elastic. So the next one is stateful sets. Um, this is sort of an attic pattern because in a service-oriented architecture or with Kubernetes, we are usually expecting stateless applications, so 12-factor apps, stuff like that. But um, with, with our uh, company, Red Cloud, we want our setup to be teared down and then put up again on another cloud provider or another Kubernetes provider. So what we're doing is actually we're also um, deploying our databases and our Elasticsearch and Kubernetes. So for that, we are using stateful set. Now for stateful set, you can actually have uh, a persistent volumes that are sticky on your pod. So the difference with the deployment and the stateful set is that the naming convention for the stateful set is that they are adding um, suffixes that are auto implementing So that the volumes that have been created for that will always belong to that pod name. So, so for that, actually, um, I'm going to demonstrate how uh, I can create a one node Elasticsearch cluster on, on, Kubernetes, on Kubernetes. So this is a stateful set uh, manifest that is going to deploy Elasticsearch. So it's similar with Ela um, the, the deployment controller. You can also um, specify the replicas here. And then on your pod spec, you can specify um, containers. For our container, we are actually going to, we're using the OSS Elastic version 6.23. Um, they have their own registry, I think. So um, you can find this in their website for, for the Docker OSS image. <laughs> I think the enterprise version also has a image. Uh, so uh, we don't have that sort of enterprise uh, communication. So you could simply say Docker pull Elasticsearch, it will pull all yeah. standard repo uh, in the Docker hub. But otherwise, if you are to Helm chart, if you are to Helm chart and Kubernetes support something called Helm chart, uh, you could uh, use Helm charts to deploy a three node Elas Kubernetes Elasticsearch yeah. cluster. So there, there's also a tool called Helm. It's sort of a package manager to Kubernetes. But <coughs> here I'm going to show you that you can as easily um, deploy your own Elasticsearch. But if you can see here, I have a volume claim template here. Uh, I have to 
I'll verify because I've been using DigitalOcean just yesterday. Because <laughs> <So, laughs> I've been really busy. So um, I think DigitalOcean has a default um, storage class name that Did you will use. Default class name? Class, class, a uh, storage class. Uh, for the persistent volume. Nila, <coughs> sa ngayon, space lang sila pangalan eh. Mm. So wala nang ano. Oh. Okay. So you can... You actually, I haven't used the... Kubernetes in digital ocean actually. Okay. So, <laughs> bago lang kasi siya, mga okay. November pa lang uh -huh. yata siya nilaunch ni, launch, ni, launch ni digital okay. ocean si Kubernetes. So, that's why I haven't I haven't touched it yet. Hindi, pa, hindi ko pa masyadong okay. nalalaro si Kubernetes sa loob ng digital ocean. Okay. So, I, I usually use ano, Docker Swarm. Mm -hmm. Okay. They have one, well, from what I've checked, <coughs> the first they use is just the spaces. <laughs> yeah. Then they introduce the block storage, which is similar to EBS so, yeah. volumes. Uh, yes, yes. So, I, I think they are already, because so I just can, follow. So, you can combine that. Uh, to mm. spaces and the, the storage mm. and the volume, so you can combine that. Because mm. okay. with Kubernetes, you can actually uh, mount volumes, like LS, uh, persistent volumes. Uh, diff persistent volumes are different from volumes, actually. Because volumes are more like uh, <coughs> the volumes in Docker. But in a way that it will persist if the container inside the pod um, is restarted or is done. But it will be done once the whole pod is, is removed. So it's still ephemeral, but it's more attached to the pod than the container. Because, um, okay, I failed to mention that in one pod in Kubernetes, you can actually have several containers if you want. So. There's one called the sidecar method in Kubernetes where you put a sidecar a container from inside a single pod where your main application is. So what, is, what it does is that, or the benefits of that is that it's going to share a, a volume, your volume, your network, uh, your network and so yeah, it's mostly the volume and the, the network. So one method for logging, for logging actually, application logging is that the sidecar method. You can have your application log to one file, and then you have a sidecar container that reads that file and then pushes it into your central uh, logging system. So you can have file reads <coughs> as a sidecar. So that's one thing. So now for the persistent volume, you can actually specify several um, persistent volume types as long as it's supported. So it supports NFS, EBS, cluster FS, uh, Ceph FS. Um, so for here, um, I have followed the, the Digital Oceans um, tutorial. I think they're already exposed, uh, exposing a storage class name. A storage class no, no man, is is saying that in this cluster has this type of storage available, and you can um, specify that uh, you can create those storage for your um, Kubernetes applications. So for Digital Ocean, they have this DO block storage. So what I'm going to create is I'm requesting one gig of the block storage. And I'm naming it as data. And here on the on the container um, on the co container spec, I'm mounting that data. So actually, the name here is refer referring to the name of the volume page. And then I'm mounting it to this. Ah, sorry. So this one, I'm, I'm naming, this one is the name of the volume frame tem template. And I'm mounting it inside the container and this path. Uh, so this is the path on the container. So mostly in Elastic, this is where Elastic stores the data. So you would want to mount uh, a persistent volume for that. 
So let's try um, deploying that one. So if you can see, it's still initializing here. Um, <clears throat> if you see here, there's, it's already running. But you can actually, if you want to find out what's going on, um, you can use kubectl describe pod, and then the pod name. The, B, the yeah. BBC. Yeah. So if you run kubectl describe actually, you can see the events that happen. So first it assigned to a node, it assigned this um, deployment to a node, and then it atta attached the volume, which is the PVC here, which is what, it, what we specified as the, the storage class. And then it's going to create the container. So once it start it starts the container, it's going to pull pull the these are actually init containers. So I had to run some um, initialization uh, commands before running the main Elasticsearch container. So actually, I can again run the port forward. So we now have Elasticsearch running <coughs> digital oceans Kubernetes. So if you want to manage your own Elasticsearch, if you want to manage your own databases like MongoDB, MySQL, so you can actually deploy it on your own Kubernetes. Now, <coughs> what if we want to expose it in public? Kubernetes is uh, what they call services. So it services their actually um, yeah, this is actually uh, sort of a DNS proxy on uh, which is internal. It's, it's internal to Kubernetes. So it's sort of a service discovery as well. And it actually load balances within, but there are three types of services. Um, one is cluster IP. These are for your applications, but you want to only expose within your Kubernetes cluster. So if you have internal applications uh, with your microservices, you just expose this with the cluster IP type service. And the other two are the node port. Um, there's a specific range of node uh, ports that you can use. Uh, but if you are deploying your own Kubernetes cluster, you can um, configure that. But the default is uh, 30,000 to 33,700 something. So, 32,767. Yeah, 32,767. So that's another one. So that's, that's good for testing, mostly. So if you want to have a connection to your application or your service. The other one is the load balancer. Um, load balancer mostly before it only supports the Google computing engine load balancer and uh, AWS load balancers, elastic load balancers. But um, I've been reading last night uh, Digital Ocean's uh, documentation. So <coughs> Kubernetes, their uh, Kubernetes deployment actually supports that. So what you can do here on your service is 
You can define it as type of load balancer. And then you can target the port of the container, which is 9200. And we're going to expose it on 80. So <coughs> I have here this selector field. This selector field actually selects the label that you put on your um, pots. So it should match the label here. So that means that this is actually serving the deployment that matches this label. So if I run this, Again, if you want to list your your services that are available, you can just run again kubectl get svc. That's the shortcut. If you were feeling industrious, you can put in service the whole the whole word. But if you can see the Elasticsearch load balancer service is still pending, so you have to wait for it to spin up the load ba the digital oceans load balancer. Ah, <coughs> I'll get to that. <laughs> so there's another method for exposing your services action. Um, it's called ingress controller. So you actually, there are, right now in Kubernetes, there are two ingress controllers that I know of. But I think there are, um, one is Nginx, the other is traffic. Um, but I think HA proxy is already <laughs> they own. So for for this one actually you can define it. <coughs> you have to install this ingress or you have to deploy this ingress controller first. And then your ingress controller must be exposed via service, which is either a load balancer, a node port, or no, just a node port or load balancer, but it's preferable to use the load balancer. And then once you have that running, you can define an ingress um, manifest. That's a, that's um, it contains the rules on what the, the domain or the host name will be, and which service will it redirect to. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. The ingress controller actually more proxies, uh, reverse proxies. <coughs> so if you can, if you can see here now, it's actually available, the load balancer is already running, and it's given us an, an external IP. So if we curl that IP, it will give us the same. So the fast the running is very So <coughs> that's it. Um, in digital ocean, it's easier actually. Actually, uh, AWS also has that support. Um, GCE also has that support. I think Azure as well. <coughs> so that's how easy it is to deploy your applications in Kubernetes. You don't need actually a developer can do it. Um, there is one company that has had this talk before. They're actually doing 20,000 deploys daily uh, through their CIC. And they only have <laughs> one to that ops there. So that's how easy it will be to manage your application, deploy your application, remove it, upgrade. Actually, when, when I show you how to increase the replica set, um, you can also um, change the <coughs> the version of your image just as easily 
you'll just change that on your manifest and then run kubectl apply and then it will do the rolling update for you um you can also specify on your manifest the the update strategy if you want a rolling update or a moving update <coughs> So um, that's it for for application management on Kubernetes. <coughs> um, are there any questions? Sure. Uh, we demoed a uh, uh, deploy Kubernetes over a cloud provider. Mm. But what if we don't want to deploy into a cloud? What specs could you recommend for development? A computer specs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you want to develop on Kubernetes on your machine, actually, there's. Um, before I get to the specs, um, there's a. Um, there's a tool called Minikube. So you can run it on your machine. It will spin up a one node Kubernetes cluster for you. Um, for us. It depends on the, the number of services, but for us, we have 32 gig memory machines for uh, uh, i7. For i7? Yeah. No. I tried for uh, 2 you can. <laughs> <laughs> you could try uh, using just the proof CDL in the background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So use the provision background and use the cube CDL service instead mm -hmm. of like installing the Kubernetes itself. So yeah. Kubernetes need more services, it need a controller, a scheduler, yes. so it consume more memory. So if you're using a lagrange like and with the kubectl, you don't need all the services. Yeah. When you, yeah. So you can just deploy the same service uh, on the your lagrange and you can expose the same services, but it's just very minimal. Yeah. There's also another tool. If you have, a, say, a Kubernetes cluster on your, uh, if your company has a Kubernetes cluster on the cloud, and you can host your other services there, and you can only host, you're just going to host your, um, the the service that you're working on on your Minikube, so that you don't <coughs> utilize all of your resources on your laptop. Um, there's an application called, or program called telepresence so you can try to look it up um, what it does is that if you have a kubernetes cluster on the cloud and you have a mini cube on your laptop what it reverse does mm -hmm. yeah it's a reverse tunnel but the in a, in a simpler th term it's going to make your mini cube um, look like it's another node on your cloud kubernetes cluster so you can actually connect to your services on your cloud. Uh, in DigitalOcean, what access node does it support on state nodes? Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah. Well, 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 so, yes. So, yes. Yes. yes, there's a point, there's a mind bug when you do the core it doesn't have any. No, no, I mean, for example, multiple pod will read a particular storage. Uh -huh. then We're wondering if you can share uh, block storage. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can share block storage. Then. I or are uh, you looking for uh, I think since it's so storage block, by storage, 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 storage from your own no, no, server? No, multiple pods so are, it's like a stake, parang stakeful, single write node when multiple read. Volume, kasi tawag sa, uh, ano, sa you want to mount a single volume across <coughs> multiple droplets? No, no, multiple can, pods. Multiple <coughs> pods. Because there are, so, sorry, okay. So when you're defining persistent volumes on, on Kubernetes, there are uh, three 
um, access modes. So I think it's three. three right? So one is read write once, which means that for each uh, for each volume, it can only be accessed by one button. Then there's read write meaning. Persistent configuration. Then for read write meaning, um, it means that one volume, um, several pods can access it. So um, usually it's the NFS. So it's an NFS, it could be multiple, but if it is a block storage, yeah, you, can't, you cannot have the multiple read and write. Because NFS, block storage is not defined in yeah. a way, so it's locked while you're just reading. Yeah. So NFS has a different read write approach. So you, you, I don't know if they have that NFS. Yeah, I, I, NFS storage for. for Digital ocean. That's why I'm curious. Or are you can just create your own <laughs> NFS with the block storage. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. They have it or not. Do you, do you have NFS storage? I I think yeah. It's just read write once because okay. here you see must be set to read write once. Uh, so it's just, just read write once. So it's better like if you want to go, just create the pod with the NFS storage. Yeah, drop the mount on the mount. Yeah. Or you so can just create the NFS cluster inside the uh, some storage from the So, any questions? And then you can create the. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, <laughs> So, you have questions that you don't like now? That's why. I think that the two more times. I'm going to put a lot of inside and then come up with this. So guys, ask questions now while it's free. When we walk out that room, there's a charge per question. <laughs> so ask questions now. So I have, I have a question. Who's, yeah. So you guys do the, you have more data, right? So how you, if you, let's say you, you have these servers, five more servers, you must have like terabytes data. Right. So when you're moving from the AWS, how do you plan to migrate that, that huge data into other provid providers or are your own premises? <coughs> um, right um, now, yeah. we're not looking at it yet, but we're planning to... Um, you're saying if you're going to move the data on the yeah. other... Um, for Elasticsearch, we can... We're, what we use usually do is back it up in our S3 buckets. Yeah. Yeah, and then there you can get it. But yeah. that's, so like changing the, sometimes if you upgrade the, your Kubernetes like mm -hmm. when you're moving somewhere. So the re-indexing will take like, if you have a big data, it's like a re-indexing takes a really huge time. So yeah. like I'm looking that there is another way that you can do from one, one in, uh, elastic server yeah, to another. Mm -hmm. So basically, there is something called remote cluster re-index. So you connect to a remote cluster. Okay. It could be anywhere, else, and then you pull data from that. Yeah, but no, no, that's not what I'm. So let's say that I have a two clusters. Okay, I have a cluster because Elasticsearch also has the compatibility issues, right? Like a 2.5 won't support with the 6.2. Yeah, obviously. So you have to update from the 2.5 to 5.6, yes. and then 5.6 to re-index. Every time they need to re-index. Uh, so not every time. Yeah. Until 5.6, probably, if you are at 2.x, you need to come up to 5.x. And then re-index. And then, no, I mean, uh, when you are coming up, that means it's just it's getting re -index. re-indexed. Okay. Um, I think I had a problem with that because we had a whole old servers which using the 2.5 right now. So I was trying to move the data from 2.5 to 5, 5.6, which is latest available on the Elastic Cloud. Right? So I can't do that because the re-indexing is compatible. So I have to re-index the data. So it is not about re-indexing, it is something that you are using because if you can call it for the API or the data structure is all internally called free maps. So what you do is that you look at what API you are consuming and what are the things that are doing with the existing structure. And there is a, in our documentation, there is something called breaking changes. 
breaking changes. So what we do is that suppose if you want to or upgrade path, we do an upgrade path. So you can go and look at it and then you know, what you would do to get to know is that okay, these are the things that I need to check before doing that. Other than that, we I think we also have an upgrade assistant. Uh, please check out it. The assistance is like the application or it's a plugin or what? Uh, upgrade assistant is a feature. Uh, I would give you more details, but uh, basically it helps you to upgrade uh, your cluster from one version to another. But not the same location. Like so I have a cluster is in the AWS host set, like on yeah. Yeah. So my cluster is an AWS, but it's my own hosting. Yeah. So okay. even that. Compatible? Yes. So is it the paid service or open source? Uh, that's what I'm looking at. So I think it is, uh, I, I, I think it's paid. I'm, I'm not really sure. I'll get back to you. We are dogs. We don't pay. <laughs> well, actually, what we did is just scan the previous cluster of the Dubai uh, Tech X version. Yeah. And since uh, it's already in JSON format, we just put away to the 5.3. Five, five no, point uh, uh, for me, it don't work. Okay. And I even I was I'm actually <coughs> in the hosted okay. environment, which is the cloud elastic. Uh -huh. So I was trying to upgrade. You cannot. You get. You have an option to upgrade. Ah, okay. So you won't. You won't upgrade because the 2.5, the data, so the, the index in the in the system which is al already there, they're not indexed. So even I update it, it won't do that. So that's why we need to put back to the you know, S3. Well, when moving from a 2.x to a 5.x, you need to rewrite the data. Yeah, that's what that's what my problem. Like, is there any other way of doing it? Because no. you are in a very old uh, version, you definitely need to do it. From 5.6, you will not be needed yeah, to do yeah, that yeah, because yeah. it's all rolling updates. This is the feature that we implemented later version. So that's the hardest way to get back out and read it and then push it back to the. Yeah, don't do that. You can do remote cluster re-indexing. You get the data, re-index the data, and a new cluster. So this is much. You spin up a new cluster mm -hmm. with 6.x, connect, use the API to pull, keep pulling the data from the index, and put in a new format. But is the directly it's support a from the? It's one single step that you need to do. 6. Point uh, X2 2.5. Yeah. Okay. You just need to look at the documentation and the lot of things because it might be something that is duplicated. That will give you error. So you just need to look through that upgrade plan. Yes. Sorry, it's a very basic question. <coughs> for what do you recommend for a company to have many clusters? Or for different departments, or just a single cluster. It's a Kubernetes cluster, right? Yes. No. <laughs> uh, single cluster. Single cluster <laughs> and put all apps in there. It <coughs> depends on your <coughs> needs. Um, Kubernetes clusters can go up until uh, thousands of yes. worker nodes. Um, but for us, we need to manage the cost. Or we need to look into the cost of each product. So we were we were putting up um, clusters for each product. Yeah, because because right now we don't have any metrics to to get the resource utilization for each product. So and especially right now we are actually going to make it a, a whole platform with several microservices microservices talking to each other, different products, then you can actually put it in one single cluster. Uh, when you have many clusters, uh, how do you manage their, their networking needs, VLANs and everything? So this cluster sees this, but the other one can how do you manage that? Right, right now, we don't have that. Um, everyone sees everyone. Yeah. So uh, you can now. That's right. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, what what we're doing right now is we, since we we're, we're with AWS, um, right now we don't have that actually we don't have that requirement yet. For, so I haven't looked at that with Kubernetes because the way we only expose these services are through node ports and uh, load balancers. So what we can do is just for for the node ports. And the load balancers is just expose it internally, and then 
those those um, services can connect um, via those node ports or load balancers, which are internally exposed. So we we at, for AWS we are we have the security groups. So we just make sure that uh, on the security groups we only whitelist um, our clusters. But you, you can use the single cluster for the different. And yeah, you can yes. uh, use the different namespaces. Yes. yes. So the namespaces is the one that we define, we differentiate. If you if you mess up with the one namespace, you don't need to worry about it. Only go with the one namespace. Yeah. So it's better to, if you have like a smaller budget, but you only have the money for one cluster, mm -hmm. you can, it's better to use that. Okay, so we, we can go down with question. 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 Ikaw mag question? Ikaw mag question? Ah. Si Speaker ito mag question. Nakakasagot na t-shirt. Ito may swans. It's free. It's free. Free! Woo! Okay. That's good. What's the name? What's the name? Okay. Ito lang. Hindi ko siya mag-usap. Ah, okay. I should have played that. Because when you do the reinnecting, you have to wait lots of time because of the data. But um, so if you're going to have one cluster, you have to be wary as well of the sizing of your master nodes. If you're managing your own Kubernetes clusters. You mean do is not enough? Hmm? Do is not enough? No, no. Uh, <laughs> you can't you can have the uh, even it should be uh, uh, three. Uh, you can have one, three. Five. Yeah, it's so it, it depends again on your usage. Because if you have already several um, worker nodes, no, no worker nodes. If, if you're already at, at that scale, so two or three won't won't cut it. Actually, there's a guide on the Kubernetes reference. Um, so lucky that they have a guide there for GCE and um, AWS for sizing. So um, one of the sizing is like for three M5 large, you can post um, I think 500 um, M5 large or M5X large uh, machines as well. So you have to be aware about that because because especially all almost all the traffic are handled by the control plane, which is the master plane. And again, <clears throat> there are several components of Kubernetes. One of them is the scheduler and the controller manager. The con what the controller manager does is that it checks what the state of the cluster is and what it should be. So that's why when you deploy <coughs> something, it's actually saved on etcd, and then controller <coughs> manager will check it. Um, what's the current state? What's what's it supposed to be? So it's supposed to have three of this. So now it will um, command the scheduler. The scheduler will now command the kubelet agent on the worker node to spin up those pods. So all the all those processes are happening on the control plane. So if you already have several machines on uh, worker nodes. You need to have a larger control thing so to handle those processes. Mm -hmm.